it's really my pleasure to welcome Claudia Quinti <laughs> here to give a keynote on family, labor markets, and policy. Claudia is professor of economics at Dartmouth College, and as many of you know, she's a global expert on gender, so she's been working on gender gaps in earnings, family policy, but also family institutions in a historical perspective, intergenerational mobility, structural transformation, so she will try to fit all of that. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> I will keep track of time. <laughs> Thank you. So it is a pleasure being here. The first thing I want to say is that I wish I had known the panel discussion because the presentation, because there are so many interesting things that came up that I would love to talk to you about, but, and I'll talk to you later. Uh, but, um, you know, I'll, I'll try, I'll try to, to do with, uh, with what I have. So let me say first that this presentation is based actually on a lot of work that I did with Barbara and, uh, and other co-author. Um, so let me start, as Barbara said, with the long-run perspective, okay? And maybe the colorful slides also help. So we were a little gloomy this afternoon. Let me say, look how far we have come so far. Not that we mm -hmm. don't have other things to solve, but let's look at something that speaks of, we made some progress and we still have a long way to go, but we did make progress, okay? So during the last 56 years, we have seen a lot of changes. Women, more than men, are entering, uh, you know, are graduating from college and are entering male-dominated field, uh, fields. And there has been a general grand convergence. And so to illustrate that, and uh, I know there are lots of lines, but let me guide through them. Let, let's, uh, let us um, kind of look at this, at this kind of positive change, okay? And by splitting um, a number of developing countries in three groups that broadly um, align with the uh, conservativeness from least to most conservativeness of, of gender norms, okay? So since I'll show you two graphs, let me first illustrate this first country. This first group of countries are, you know, Anglo-Saxon countries, Australia, um, UK, US, uh, and Canada, and, and Scandinavia. So these are, if you look at studies of norms, they tend to be more uh, liberal. On the opposite end, you have Southern, East, Southern Europe, Italy, Greece, uh, Spain, Portugal, uh, Southern America, uh, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Taiwan, okay, which on the spectrum tend to be more gender conservative, and in between continental Europe that is in between. Okay? So let me say that you know, over this time period, so each of these little points, so let's take Australia, each of these little points represent what was the gender employment gap in the 80s. So each point is a decade, okay? This is the employment gap in the 80s, in the 90s, 2000s, and 2010s, okay? So across the board, you see some pattern of convergence uh, with the gender gap closing from about, you know, even 50 uh, percentage points um, in, the, in the 70s to you know, some in the range of 10 to 20 percentage points. And this convergence is observed, these countries are coming from further away, but it's observed in most of these two groups of countries, and as well in some of the others, although, although in this group that is more gender conservative, the gender gap, so these negative numbers, um, is, is still quite large today, except for, I think that is um, Portugal. Okay, Portugal and Spain, okay? So you have a measure of convergence in employment over this time period. And you also, we see um, a measure of convergence in, uh, in gender earnings gap among the same set of countries, okay? And if you're, so with, the, with gender gaps generally going, I mean, I'm going to use the number from the US for the typical 60%, which was, which means that uh, uh, women made 60 cents to the men dollars to about 80, 80%, 80 okay? And um, if you're wondering what is going on here with Southern Europe, where it seems like the gap in, uh, in earnings are very small, uh, in part, that is due to just selection, to the fact that because the norm are conservative, the average woman who works is actually, is actually kind of better 
then the average man has higher wage characteristics. So the gap looks small, but the point is that you're comparing in this country <coughs> the average man to the average highly educated woman. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's what you get. Okay, so we have a sense of convergence, but, and I'm going to go back to the spirit of this session, obviously, <laughs> still we have huge um, gender differential in earnings that persist and are, are mostly linked to the fact that, um, <coughs> to children, okay, uh, as, we, as, as it was said over and over in this today, right, the presence of children, because of the gender division of labor and who does what, enhances, exacerbate any initial, even small difference in earnings into something very large. Okay, and this is this is particularly important for the college graduate, for the MBAs graduates, and and the reason is that these are women uh, who, like many of you in this room, enter really demanding, time demanding, what Claudia Goldin called greedy uh, occupations, okay? And in those occupations, there is a huge return to working a lot of hours. There is a huge return taking really, really tiny breaks or no breaks. Um, and, and so they just lose, okay? So I'm really sorry, since we talk about fathers, I, I should have had another, I took this from another presentation of mine, I should have another little five here because this graph is supposed to describe to you what happens dynamically. So upon graduation, you see that the earnings of men and women are pretty much identical, okay? But look at what happened 20 years later. Okay, 20 years later, the gap widens, okay? And it's mostly due to, you know, even if you are, if you don't marry actually, and it's mostly due to having children not just because, let me say, this graph, let me call it, you are a woman, <laughs> so there is a, a, some kind of bias, but also, and here is where I wish I had another little power here, because men actually, um, I forgot uh, who was discussing the, the men um, uh, before. Eugene. Eh? No. <laughs> Just one second, I'm ranking out her name, Ivona. As Ivona was saying earlier on, uh, discussing Canada, she was saying that the men take leave and it doesn't seem that they lose much. In fact, if you look at the average, and then we discuss how maybe some CEOs mm -hmm. might take leave and actually that doesn't matter. But what I'm going to say is that even on average, while women uh, lose when they have a child, men to tend to actually, their earnings are higher on average than known fathers when you do 20 years out, okay? So we can uh, we can discuss why. So I think that's another interesting question. Why is it that, um, you know, it could be that fathers work harder, okay? Than only the best men have kids, okay? Uh, or there could be something else in the culture, okay? That, you know, instead of, um, but maybe a man, uh, when he has a child, as a family is more reliable, or something about that, that I really don't know. And I would love to get your input because it is a quite incredibly interesting question that has not been really studied. This question about why there is actually not just a mother penalty, but a father premium, and it's very hard to get it. So I'd love to get your input later on. Okay, so we still have a child penalty. And in part, I already discussed the, the fatherhood premium. Here, what I want to do, and this is in a sense a way to summarize uh, this discussion, I want, to bring, I want to bring it back to the fundamental economic reason why, um, I mean, in, in the terms of an economic model, we think there might be this strong trade-off between career and friends, okay? And the idea, okay, so let's go over the classical, the beggar mm -hmm. model of household specialization. So people are, in general, maybe they work for a firm, right? But they're also organized into households, okay? Households, they typically have children, okay? So in the, in the, in the original, in the, this just simple model, the idea is that spousal gaps in labor supply and earnings <coughs> may emerge because one of the two partners has comparative advantage in doing uh, kind of child rearing, 
Okay, and the other one has a comparative advantage, say, in market production. The, and, and so they, they have potentially higher earnings, okay? The problem is that what is underlying that comparative advantage, okay? So it could be that there are gender norms, right, that reflect stereotypes. So people think that it's bad for a mom to work. It's going to be, a, it's going to have a negative effect on her young child, okay? That affect your choices, okay? Are they choices exactly if you drop out of the labor market? So the point I think, and it's where policies or what firms can do enter, is that this kind of division of labor that is emphasized, that even becomes larger once you take into account the fact that men and women work for different firms, who might be making assumption about what their role would be in the future, who might assign them to different career tracks because of the, what they expect would be down the line. After all, you can't have a woman sign a contract that says that her husband is going to do at least 50% of child care once she has a child, okay? So all of these things are unobservable and contribute to this feedback effect to to generate a spousal gap in labor supply and, and that, you know, need not be gendered, but historically it is, okay? With women historically uh, taking the role of the second earner or the primary caregiving and men uh, taking the other role, okay? And here was, I want to emphasize that this is the right, from the standpoint of the household, you can think in an economic model, this is rational, okay? If you know, if a couple expects that the society overall uh, is going to think that this household, maybe they are both, you know, they have the degree from the same college, they're both low, uh, have also a low degree from the same university, they are working in the same firm at a very high level, but they have an expectation that there are things down the line that might imply that it's going to be easier to combine having children and a career and high earning growth if only one of the two does that. And that person that does that is going to be a man, okay? So I want to say that this is what we call, and the firms are going to make an assumption that it's a woman who's going to take the second uh, kind of earner role, as I said before, what I want to say is that in economics, we call this statistical discrimination, okay? <coughs> statistical discrimination would say that a firm is going to make assumption about my behavior as a woman when I have a child on the basis of historically what has been observed, okay? And that is something that, going back to this discussion, is really hard to break, okay? So, um, so that's, let's keep that in mind, okay? So, in all of this, in this framework, what is the role that government policy might have, okay? And what is the role the firm policy might have? The reason why I brought out the model is that the model makes you think about uh, a very simple point, okay? That any policy that makes women more, less similar to men, more diverse, like a very general childcare policy that we all agree would be great, but what if, as and in fact, as is, and is as happened to, as we saw today in Eugene work, what if that that policy, right? The women take all their leave, and that policy is going to make even more evident in the mind of the employer the fact that she has, after all, the primary caregiver. So that model implies that you know policies that are more effective are policies where you improve the situation but in a way that doesn't make women more different than men in terms of what they're going to do in the labor market, okay? in terms of taking interruption and primary role, okay? And I think this is a helpful thing to keep in mind when we analyze, when I give you somewhat of a summary of what are the results in terms of policies that we have seen in the literature, okay? Which policy work, which policy work maybe a little, uh, Worse, and which policy can potentially backfire? And I'm sorry, I have to say. So, I put here that when we think about family policy, we're going to discuss a few, okay? But very quickly, I'm, I'm just going to give you basically um, 
a review, a survey, a summary of all the studies and what are the findings from the literature, from the vast economic literature that Barbara and I have by now surveyed twice. Okay. <laughs> so uh, for family policy, what is going to be important is whether the policy is protected, whether it's paid, how much is paid, where is the money coming from, okay? These policies, uh, as, as I've discussed later, might in some cases be effective in fostering employment, but maybe they back, they backfire on earnings is just exactly because of the model that I highlighted before. Okay, other policies have to do with childcare, and uh, I forgot who mentioned it uh, before, but childcare is really, I think, I agree, is the answer. Uh, seems to be, and at least what, for what we saw in the data, it seems to be the one policy where at least at the, this is a government mandate, it's not uh, firm provided, firm do not provide subsidies, but at the government level, countries that offer more generous support for early childhood education are also countries where women's employment is higher, for example. It's one of the policies that is consistently showing some positive results. Okay, but, and I think this came up in the discussion, I would to say that other things that matter, and, um, and again, so are, you know, what are the hours of the schools? Why do schools end at three? Why do we have to figure out the after school what program our child is doing so, I mean, and so forth, okay? My experience was that I thought that when my child went to elementary school, I was done, right? <laughs> I didn't have to figure out all these things. And it turns out I had it easy earlier on. Because once they go to elementary school, then you have to figure out activities, you have to figure out after school program, you have to figure out summer school, and that typically fell for on women. So I think there is something also that is, you know, more seriously institutional about the way, now it's not just the work, okay, it's a more general discourse about also the way in which in, instruction uh, in, uh, in the, um, kind of is provided, what are the, what is the production function, how, why is that so complicated to handle for to earn a family. Maybe it's something that we have to think about more carefully too, and it doesn't require a lot of money uh, from a standpoint of a government. And, but also private firms that I'll discuss at the end, and um, might provide protected leave or paid leave. That is not so much of an issue, I think, here in the UK, but it is a real issue in the US, where, as you will see in a second, Basically, at the federal level, there is no paid leave. Okay, so this map, I was just trying to put together, we discussed many countries in this presentation. This map represents what is the generosity of uh, the maximum amount of leave uh, for mother in the US and around the world, okay? And as you can see, in red, we all only have the US, and Papa Guinea over here, okay? <laughs> and because at the federal level, we have no paid leave. And then, you know, you see an interesting variation. What I want to say is that in the US, it's not as bleak as you think, in the sense that, okay, in the sense that the following, okay, the US, all that you have at the federal level is the FMLA that was passed in 1993 that provides 12 weeks of mandated, not paid, mandated, uh, protected leave to women who works for uh, firms that have at least 50 plus employees in a, in a So, I mean, it's, it's quite strict, okay? But th this is, in fact, in the US, it's just the tip of the iceberg because there is also no mandate paid vacation and there is no mandate to offer many other things that uh, there are things. But, but things are moving, in a sense, in the US, just to bring a ray of hope. Uh, as, as often happened in, uh, in American history, the, uh, it is the state that moves first, okay? And so the blue, the dark blue line are the states that have had uh, some form of paid leave. It's not super generous, but some form of paid leave in place uh, for a while. California was the f first one, then New Jersey and so forth, and more and more states are coming in, finding different formulas for offering this very difficult thing, which is to pay maternity leave for 12 weeks, okay? But I want to say there are also states that in, in this map in 2021, like Arizona, 
um, was discussing passing uh, paid leave for everybody, and the law was rejected. So by now that's a black. So I don't know how long it's going to take um, for that to happen. Okay. So let me give you a little bit more sense of how that variable um, uh, that represent maximum weeks of protected uh, leave available. I want to use this graph uh, going back to the gender employment gap to give you a sense of the variation both in terms of policies and in terms of gender gap um, among countries. And again, I think this is a useful exercise to put the discussion I think that we had together in place. Um, so the first thing to note is that the, 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 ray, the variation in maximum uh, weeks offered to mothers across country is huge. Because we go, this is not paid leave, it's just job protected. So we go from a minimum of 12 to a maximum of more than 200 weeks, at least at that point in time, okay? This is maximum weeks, it's not paid, right? And, um, and how, does the, but how does that relate to the employment gap? Well, you know, there is and there isn't. It looks like it depends on where, you know, sometimes I feel like, you know, you, you just draw a line that's close to zero. Or, um, or, you know, it depends on which country you want to exclude, you might see a slightly kind of um, positive effect of more leave on the employment gap, meaning that, but, but not much. And here I want to highlight, highlight again, a bunch of countries by the conservativeness of their gender norms. And I don't know, no, I'm doing the wrong one. So here we put Scandinavia, ah, and uh, then we have the UK and the US, and then Italy, okay? So here though, you see something very interesting, I think, is that when we start thinking about what factors, what, what is driving, okay, this dragging on, this persistent gender gap that has to do, even, even in when there are very generous policies, <laughs> You know, one starts thinking about norms, right? How many is gender norms? And gender norms, uh, maybe countries that are more conservative, offer fewer weeks of paid leave, for example, or less generous policy. But if you look at this graph, you know, you kind of, eh, yes and no, right? It is true that these countries are much more generous, but here you have a quite a range of countries that more or less are situated around the same line, okay? so. The thing is that can it be, and in the next slide, I'm going to show you directly how the maximum weeks of job protected leave, so the vertical axis hasn't changed, relate to Ayuda, the, uh, <laughs> to this question about whether free, preschool children suffer. Okay? And here I think, uh, let me place again all our countries. Okay? Here I think something that is food for thought, and it's interesting, when we think about this institution, because it's really hard for us as economists to identify the political economy of all of this, why? You know, so it's, it's something that we leave outside of the discourse, right? But here, and I'm gonna use the graph to give you a sense of this, you see that, you know, countries like Italy and Denmark have kind of the same number of weeks of job protected leave, even if they are at the opposite rate, right, in terms of norms, okay? So I think, and uh, perhaps there is something that, um, there is a way in which gender norms affect the way in which, so I would say the devil is in detail. Every time we talk about policies, right, there is a way in which the way, the, the structure of the policy, okay, whether it's driven by pronatalist uh, motivation or is driven by women's demand, that is going to have a huge difference in terms of how the policy is designed and what are its effects on women. For instance, for in Italy, it was really a pronatalist pol policy. In many countries, these policies were put in place after World War II in a period of high fertility. So, I mean, I think, uh, again, what I'm going to come back to is that the broader discussion, when we think about gender, I think we need to really, and this came up in the conversation, open up a much broader discussion of, uh, you know, a, a synergistic intervention that no one policy is going to actually really uh, 
you know, solve the problem, okay? Uh, and, all right, so I, um, I gave you a little bit of a sense of what the variation is in, in gap in employment and um, in terms of policies. So what can we learn from decades? And as Barbara said, I'm bringing you on a journey that started in the 1970s. It's a little too long, maybe. Okay. <laughs> what can we learn from decades of legislation and policy evaluation about the role of this family policy? And since we discussed this, I'll go, I'll go kind of quickly. So for parental leave, there is the very micro studies that try to identify the impact of leave on, on, on women's employment. There seems to be not <coughs> much of an effect. And there is some in cross-country studies that kind of capture more of a macro a combination of policies that shows how parental leave extension are maybe positive on employment, but could have the potential of negative impacts on maternal earning, okay? We discuss uh, involving more father, and that's really important, but has been uh, suggested the only uh, stuff that seems to work are the quotas, because men are, are not, you know, it was discussed today, I think in Egypt uh, work, for example, that uh, you have to force father to take it. And then, I don't know if someone said, oh, <laughs> it's again Ivana that says that uh, when, the, when her colleague takes leave, it's a whole different experience. Well, there is a study that shows that in the U.S., when they pass gender-neutral policy, in the sense that in, in colleges, in the sense that both moms and dad could take the same amount of time off, basically that had a negative impact on the probability that women got tenure because the women were at home kind of working and taking care of the children while their husband probably were home just working on their papers. So there's a, no, a cautionary title on the, on the law of, of gender neutral policies. And the main and most effective policy seems to be child care. So I think when you analyze like a meta study of all the studies of these policies, it seems to suggest that from a government standpoint, the, the, the common theme is to make it easier for women to combine the two. And no, and I think it's helpful just not to focus the discussion on one item at a time. And, and so, but, but I think that the next step is really thinking about childcare, um, how, how to make this work. Okay. So in all this, uh, in all this, Discussion, this is just the role of the government, but what are companies doing? So I really love the panel discussion here and how much I learn about what Procter & Gamble is doing because I think it's really uh, impressive and promising. Uh, and that, you know, in a sense, so which firm though? So there are certainly firms that are investing, okay, in trying to, um, provide more family-friendly amenities and trying to tackle more directly the issue of uh, inequality uh, in pay, in careers, and so forth, okay? But which firms are uh, providing, which firms are doing this? Is there, does, is there variation by industry? Is it the smaller firm, the bigger firms, okay? This is kind of hard for us economies to uh, tackle because firms keep, it's very hard to understand when you look at a website, sorry, not a criticism, to understand what are the benefits that are being offered, okay? That's just kind of set one. So in, uh, in, in work with some of, the, of my co-authors that we did a few years ago, we started working all over, okay? So we scraped Great Places to Work, which is the company that provides the data for the fortune best company uh, in the field. After we scrape so much, I think it's not possible anymore, okay? But we could get information on the gender composition, core composition, the type of policies that were offered in terms of paid leave for moms, for dads, um, uh, emergency childcare, and so forth, okay? And then we work through using you know, a bunch of other sources, other aggregators of companies, 
Uh, we had undergraduate doing cold calls to company to ask what their benefits were and so forth, okay? So this research was really interesting because we could come out with a, with a sample of um, about five, 600 firms across different industry. Many uh, um, firms in this room are represented, <laughs> at least uh, two that I'm aware of because they were on the ranking of best firms to work for, okay? And, um, but first, let me give you this, this, um, this graph, okay? So we as economists, and I think today I get a little more from you than you from me, okay? But we as economists, first question we think is, is it the case that it's the firms that have more women, right? Might, might make sense that are offering uh, more generous benefits, okay? And it's yes and no, I mean, the answer, it depends. So in this graph, what I'm, what I'm plotting, and let's focus on the red dots first, is based on that data collection. Um, so on the horizontal axis, you have of share female, and this is the health sector, healthcare sector overall, so this is very aggregate. And on the vertical axis, you have weeks of fully paid leave offered to both moms and dads, okay? So something interesting emerges is that in professional, technical, or, you know, information, IT, manufacturing, where there are fewer women, those are the, the, the type of sector that overall, on average, tend to provide more generous uh, leave policy, okay? And as you move towards more women, kind of the generosity uh, of the paid leave for moms declines. And here the important caveat is that these are firms, we're just focusing on the quarters, so, uh, I mean on the part of the, of the company that is in the US. And again, remember in the US there is no federal leave, okay? So it seems that firms are doing something, they are, work, they are financing, they're offering paid leave, of at least 12 weeks to months, okay? But the relation with percent female is unclear, okay? Um, and at the same time, and this is very important, they're offering obviously the same benefit to fathers, okay? And in fact, what is interesting here, if you compare, so for example, uh, for overall in the professional technical industry, um, um, around 2020, uh, firms were offering, firms in our sample were offering paid leave, were offering about 17 weeks on average to women and um, about eight weeks to men, okay? And in information manufacturing, the difference is smaller, uh, retail, finance. So it looks like, uh, at least in the US, what firms have done is to pay the, the, is to fully pay for the, for the federal leave and some more for women and uh, pay basically the six to eight weeks, the first six to eight weeks, so equating childbirth to a short-term disability, the first six to eight weeks, I think they're coming out of the short-term disability. So that's the difference between men and women. So they tend to be offered a very similar uh, deal, except that for women, you have to add those six to eight weeks around childbirth, okay? So that's, that's one fact, right? So we can discuss, I think it would be very interesting to have your, your perspective on why, you know, there is this type of trend, okay? One thing that is, I think, very interesting, and um, this is, so I, I wanted to focus on, on, a, on a, couple, a couple of sectors, the finance, insurance, the professionals, and so we wanted to provide, so this is a picture of the economy of the firms operating in 2020, right? But what has been the progression as women enter more and more in this type of jobs, what has happened over time, okay? Is this something that firms, is, is leave something that firms are competing on to try to attract talent uh, or not? So. I feel silly, but to, did the, to do this, what we did was to take, um, to use, we use Working Mother magazine, 
the November issue. <laughs> so, going back in time. so every November since the 1990s, Modern <laughs> Magazine was published in this ranking, and so we kind of use them. And I th and I think uh, people in this room will find this graph interesting. Okay, <laughs> so here we focus from starting in 2003, and and here I have to say the reason why we don't go. And we don't have longer series is that we wanted to be sure that we were counting the, the weeks of leave that were fully paid. Okay. We didn't want to muddle things up. Okay. So that, that was something we tried to um, do. Um, so what do you see here? I mean, I think we see a little bit of a leapfrogging. Okay. So uh, I think this is. What is that? This is K KPMG. It started very low, around two weeks of paid leave. These are just mother. It jumped to about 10. And by 2018, <coughs> it's about 16 weeks. EY also, quite generous. And then you have the Deloitte and the KPMG. And, and let me show you the, what these last points are. So by December 2023, at least based on what we could find on the web, Deloitte and KP were offering 24 weeks, actually, of fully paid leave. Uh, PwC was offering 20 weeks, and Accenture and EY, 16 weeks of fully paid leave to mother, okay? So I think what I want to say here is that it looks like you guys are somewhat... Um, um, kind of raising, uh, you know, this is an indication that things are happening. And and I want to bring, though, we we, we kind of brought in um, child care, okay? And it is also true that some companies, and some started quite early, like in the 1990s, ask, you know, kind of corporate child care company like Bright Horizon to kind of, to have you know, they organize things so that they have a childcare really nearby the office, either in the same block or you know across the street. Okay? And so, um, so in this case, it's that company. And then I'll show you another one. So if for financial services, here the leader seems to be Goldman, but now it's more Capital One uh, and Deutsch. Um, but these firms actually they were attuned to the fact that women need. Uh, childcare and uh, and here are the bright horizon okay that are open in some cases starting in 1986 okay so right at a time where very 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 few women around okay so what do we learn from that okay so it seems that family uh, firms are indeed competing by you know using this lever uh, of family friendly policies okay but May I say that mostly they're competing with the cheaper policies, I mean, like the low-hanging fruits, which are the paid leave, and also, by now, most firms offer true bright horizon pay emergency care, so they would send your babysitter if you have to leave at last minute and your kid is sick, okay? Um, but I think they're also, and we discussed some of that in the panel discussion, right? What you do, what you're doing, I call changing the production function. Mm -hmm. Okay, so are there also more costly intervention? Do we want to have a childcare center, for example, Patagonia? At the center of their company, they have a childcare center who has been there since the '80s, and they publicize it. I, you know, after we publish our JP Barbara, they send me a book. <laughs> we agree with you that child care is very important, <laughs> and we have been doing that since the okay. eighties. <laughs> there you go. So it's I think it's really interesting to study. So, so to, to this audience, I'm, I'm fascinated about talking to you all. Um, but what I'm hoping, and I think some of this came up in the panel discussion, is that this is not about policies, uh, mandating stuff. But I'm hoping that you know there is a very high competition of talent for talent, okay? And guess what? The talent pool is becoming increasingly female, okay, at a very high level and increasingly diverse. Mm -hmm. So my hope is that competitive pressure <laughs> would would uh, 
would help in a sense, because I mean, I think the point is uh, firms are leaving a lot of time on the table by not, by maybe, you know, having structure in place where women abandon the labor force. And then you have all, the, maybe they want to come back. And I think that's another point uh, that is very important when they're in their 40s or in their 50s and the children are old, but how do you come back? Okay, I think there is a, a very large pool of talent that is still untapped, I would say. Um, but so I've been working on, we, we work with some uh, business school students to write the Patagonia Shiker Center case. But I think the point that I would want to get your input on and um, that I want to work on in the future is can we solve the gender, I mean, can firm level strategic decision like that try to explore, the, explore not the comparative advantage, you see, I'm so much into models of time allocation that I wrote comparative instead of competitive advantage, <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay, is there a case for a business case for gender equality that is coming from some firms at least um, kind of making firm level strategic decision and that, that, that might lead to a competitive advantage actually. And I think the answer as was exemplified in this discussion is going to be a mixture. On the other hand, it's going to depend on the company culture, of course, for some companies this is much more in line with their culture than others. But there is this other pressure that is coming from the talent pool and the need to attract talent that perhaps is going to interact in interest ways. And that's it. Thank you. So thank you very much, Claudia. <laughs>